In today's tutorial, we'll look at ultrasound and infrasound. The first aim is to define the terms ultrasound and infrasound, then describe their properties and uses, and finally calculate distance using ultrasound, something known as echolocation. Now, one year before I was born, a very famous film came out by the name of Alien. Now, I'm sure you're aware of the franchise, as there have been several films since, but in my opinion, none of them have captured what the first film was able to do. One thing that really stood out for me for that film was the tagline that came with it. You may have heard it yourself. It went, In space, no one can hear you scream. Now, I thought that was pretty clever on two levels. One, obviously, it related to the horror theme that the film was. But also, as a statement, it happened to be scientific fact. Now, this is quite interesting. Why can't you hear sound in space? Well, quite simply, because sound doesn't travel in space. Now, this is quite interesting because light does. Both of them are waves. Why doesn't sound travel through space? Well, the simplest answer is sound requires matter for it to be transmitted. So let's say you were an astronaut in distress, screaming your head off and hurtling towards Earth. You would not hear your own voice until you penetrated our matter-rich atmosphere. Then suddenly your astronaut would have a particle-rich medium in which sound can conduct itself, travel through. All sound requires is a force to get it going. A musical instrument such as a horn could provide this force and it would cause particles to vibrate and as they vibrate they knock into other particles causing them to vibrate which knock into other particles causing them to vibrate and so on and so on. Now this is how sound travels through air, a gas. Now in a solid where the particles are much closer, sound conducts itself much faster because the particles don't have to move as far before they bump into another particle. That's why sound travels fastest in solids and slowest in gases. Okay, so the first thing to realize is sound, just like light, basically has a range of frequencies. So you have an audio spectrum, much, much like you have a spectrum of light or an electromagnetic spectrum. And similarly, just as in light, we can only detect a certain range of frequencies. Our ears have evolved just to detect between 20 hertz, that's low, to 20,000 hertz. But that's more likely the case if you're young. If you're older, your hearing range becomes more narrow. If we go below 20 hertz, then we enter the realms of infrasound. The prefix infra means below, so below the sound we can hear. Just like infrared is below the red we can see. If we go above 20,000 hertz, then we enter the realms of ultrasound. These are very high frequency, high pitched sounds that we cannot hear. Remember that sound waves are longitudinal, not transverse like light waves. So in an exam, if you have to define what infrasound is or ultrasound is, you would say, for example, for infrasound, a longitudinal wave with a frequency below 20 hertz. For ultrasound, for two marks, you'd say a longitudinal wave with a frequency above 20,000 hertz. Now, just like it's fun to imagine with light, I also think it's fun to imagine with sound. See, there's a whole auditory world out there that we can't access because it's beyond the uh, range of our hearing. But other animals and pieces of technology can emit and detect such sounds. For example, tigers communicate with infrasound, elephants communicate with infrasound, whales communicate with infrasound. You may notice they have something in common, they are all very large animals. Large animals have larger larynxes or voice boxes and therefore produce sounds with a longer wavelength. When volcanoes erupt or earthquakes start happening, they produce infrasound. And quite interestingly, some believe that so-called haunted houses have a lot to do with infrasound. In many of these houses, they find uh, low-frequency generators, old bits of machinery that emit very low frequencies of sound. And some people believe low frequencies of sound can have very bizarre effects on the body. That kind of eerie feeling that your hairs at the back of your neck are standing on end. Dizziness as well as nausea. It's also been reported that a certain frequency of low sound can make humans lose control of their bowels and they actually try to weaponize that frequency of sound in the war. If we go to the other end of the spectrum, well there we have animals that can hear ultrasounds, such as dogs. That's how dog whistles work. We can't hear them, but dogs can. Rats can also detect ultrasound and dolphins and bats can produce ultrasonic frequencies as well as detect them. So they actually communicate using ultrasound. But the key thing to remember here is infra is below 20 hertz, ultra is above 20,000 hertz. Just remember 20, 20, but 1,000 at the end for ultra. 
And that's how we define the terms ultrasound and infrasound. So now let's look at the properties and uses of ultrasound and infrasound by us and other animals. One of the most important properties of ultrasound with its short wavelength and very high frequency is it can be partially reflected. So just like with light, as sound, let's say emitted from this dolphin, travels from one medium to another of different density, some of it will travel through and refract, as you might expect, with, as in with light, but some of it also gets reflected, and this is very useful to us. Similarly, when boats use ultrasonic emitters, they can do the same thing to locate the distance of the seabed. So they emit an ultrasonic frequency, or ultrasonic wave, which travels to the seabed, and then some of it will continue to go through, where some of it will also get reflected, partially reflected. And this is how prenatal scans work as well. If you think about it, you've got lots of different mediums here with different density. Here's the ultrasonic emitter, the thing that produces ultrasound. And you've got skin, you've got muscle, you've got amniotic fluid, you've got the baby with the bones and everything. So just like before, the sound travels as such and gets reflected as it travels through mediums of different density and so on. The timings and distribution of these echoes are processed by a computer to produce an image on a screen so we can get a representation of the fetus inside the womb. So to put it into words for you, some energy gets reflected as sound travels through mediums of different density. Remember when sound gets reflected we call it an echo. And as you've just seen, computers can time the delay between the emitted and reflected sound wave to estimate the distance of an object. Animals can do this too. That's how bats and dolphins echolocate. So now let's look at that low frequency wave with a long wavelength called infrasound. Infrasound, just like radio waves with their long wavelength, can diffract around hills and therefore travel very, very long distances. So as a wave travels, and you expect it maybe to be reflected by this hill, instead it arcs round it and carries on moving. This arcing is called diffraction. Tigers use low frequency infrasound that we cannot hear to mark their territory. So they have low frequency growls that travel very long distances and mark their, say, two kilometer radius territory, warning other tigers to basically go away because they're solitary animals. And tigers are so scary, even other tigers fear them. Some microphones have been developed to detect such low frequency sounds and growls so they can track animal movements. And probably most usefully for us, we can use infrasound to detect meteor strikes, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions from very far away before they do lethal damage. Some human communities are so in tune with nature that they observe animals very closely. If they suddenly see that herds of animals are fleeing an area, they will follow, even if they can't detect any reason to. This is because animals can perceive things we can't. In this case, most likely the animals detecting infrasound from something like an earthquake or some sort of natural disaster. You see, when an earthquake happens, it releases infrasound waves first before the damage is done. The animals, upon hearing these low frequency sounds, realize something bad is about to happen, so they scram and humans follow pretty quickly. So to summarise, ultrasound above 20,000 Hz can be partially reflected and therefore used for echolocation to estimate distance of certain objects. They are partially reflected when they go through mediums of different density. Infrasound below 20 Hz has a much longer wavelength and therefore can travel very long distances. Even hills don't stop them because they diffract around hills. Certain animals use infrasound to mark their territory and we can use infrasound to detect potential natural hazards, such as earthquakes and meteor strikes. So that is how to describe the properties and uses of ultrasound and infrasound. Okay, so it's maths time. We have to calculate the distance of an object using ultrasound. This comes up quite a lot in exams, but it's nothing to worry about. It's one of the easiest calculations you can do. Now, once again, I'm not gonna teach you how to rearrange. I'm just gonna show you the rearranged state of this equation and I'll do another tutorial showing you how to rearrange. I appreciate in science lessons you're given triangles to remember. I personally don't recommend triangles because if you don't understand how to rearrange, it just means having to memorize hundreds of triangles into an exam and it's not a very good idea. It's much better to take one technique in with you which helps you. But anyway, if you remember this equation, speed equals distance over time. You learn this throughout your science education. 
In this case, it's wave speed, the speed of the sound wave. But notice the units. Speed is in meters per second, distance in meters, and time in seconds. So meters divided by seconds gives you meters per second. So let's take a scenario where a submarine has emitted an ultrasonic frequency and this wave is traveling towards the seabed and then it gets reflected as an echo back towards the submarine. Now what you need to know in this is the speed that the uh, wave is traveling at, which is 1520 meters per second. That's the average speed of sound in water and how long the return trip took. So it took 4.5 seconds there and back. That's why I've done two different colors here. So remember, what we want to work out is the distance, how far away this seabed is. So this equation in this state will not do. We must rearrange it. So we need things in terms of distance. So distance goes here. So the rest should be pretty easy. It doesn't matter where you put the other two. It has to go here and here. So wave speed times time equals distance. And that's the formula you need to know for ultrasound calculations. So all we have to do is plug in the real world figures into the equation. So we can put wave speed here, which is 1520 meters per second, and we can put time or return time here, which is 4.5 seconds. And if we multiply those two things together, we'll get the distance, which is 6840 meters. But remember, this is the distance there and back. It doesn't actually tell you the distance to the seabed. So remember the golden rule when it comes to ultrasound calculations. Always divide the distance, the answer you get, by 2. Always. So the distance there and back is 6,840 metres, but just there, you divide it by 2, is 3,420 metres. And that is your answer. So please do not forget this stage and always show your working out. Okay, your turn. So you can read this and pause it and try and calculate it. The question says, a pulse of ultrasound takes 0.0005 seconds to travel to the head of a fetus and back again. The average speed of sound in the body is 1540 meters per second. Calculate the distance of the scanner from the fetus. So pause it now and have a go. Firstly, remember the equation, distance equals wave speed times time. And now underline the key part. So we know time is 0.0005 seconds. If it's not clear in what it says, and just look at the units, seconds, so it must be time. And the speed is 1540 meters per second. So if you multiply these two figures together, you will get 0.077 meters. But don't forget the golden rule, always divide the answer by two. And if you do that, you'll get 0.0385 meters. And if you want, you could divide that by 100 to get the answer in centimeters, which would be 3.85 centimeters. You'd probably get full marks for either answer, but check to see whether it specifies you have to answer in centimeters or meters. And that's how you calculate distance using ultrasound.